Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Karen Ross. I am the Director of Graduate Programs and Conflict Resolution in the Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance. Um, and I would like to welcome you all to our annual Benjamin and Sylvia Slomoff and Judith Green Luce Lectureship in Conflict Resolution. Um, we are very honored this afternoon to be joined by Dr. Khalil Gibran Muhammad, who is the, the director of, institutional, of the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project and the Ford Foundation Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, and whose lecture is entitled The Truth About Truth-Telling and Racial Justice, Field Notes from Northern Ireland, Rwanda, and South Africa. You'll hear, hear more about him in just a moment. Um, we're also joined by several very important members of our community, including Dean Kiki Adozi um, of the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. Um, we will shortly be joined by the provost, Joe Berger, um, and of course, all of the faculty, students, and staff in our department. I want to thank everyone for being here, and I especially want to thank our department staff, Kelly Ward, Jason Fizzano, and Lee Murphy for everything they've done to prepare for today's lecture and make this lecture, which is one of our highlights every year, a success. Um, in addition to the lecture, Dr. Mohammed just met in a previous session with a group of our students. So as you can imagine, um, putting together multiple events for a day such as like this is a tremendous amount of work. Um, so Lee, Kelly, and Jason, thank you all very, very much. Okay. Before we move on, let me say a few words about the benefactor on whose name this lectureship is, Ben Slomoff. And I'm gonna preface this by saying that unlike some of the other faculty who are in the audience today, I was not here when Ben was at UMass Boston. So that's a preview of what I'm about to tell you. Um, however, stories about him ab abound in our program and in our department. Um, I was able to meet him, I think it twice, um, at our annual lectureship. And of course, I've heard a lot about him um, from family members who are here today as well. Um, so I'm going to do my best uh, to paint a picture of Benjamin Slomoff. And um, if there's anything I leave out, those of you in the audience who knew him better than I, uh, please feel free to jump in. So for those of you who have not been at this lecture before and have not, or who have not heard about Benjamin Slomoff, he was a student in the conflict resolution program at UMass Boston. He received first a certificate and then a master's in 1997 after he completed his bachelor's degree at UMass Boston in 1993. But there's more to it than that. His academic pursuits and everything that followed came in his retirement. Ben owned a successful shoe business for many years and prior to that, had an extended career in the armed forces starting during World War II. When he came to our program, he was in his 80s. After he finished his master's degree, Ben launched a new career as a mediator and an arbitrator. As I understand it, through the 2010s, Ben mediated and arbitrated multiple times a week. And I think I have heard that sometimes he held multiple million dollar clients in his docket all at once. So that's something for me that's hard for me to imagine now. Um, it's harder for me to imagine doing this in retirement in his 80s, 90s, and hundreds. Um, and then I was told that in addition to this mediation arbitration work, Ben also published two books of poetry um, in the 2010s. He was a regular presence at the Slomoff Lectureship, flying out from California many years. And he joined us in 2020 over Zoom for the Slomoff Lectureship, um, which was early in the, we were just talking about this earlier this afternoon, early in the COVID pandemic. Um, I remember seeing him on screen that evening for the talk, which was given by the current Dean of the Fletcher, law, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Rachel Kite. In December, 2020, few weeks after he turned 107 years old and passed away peacefully in his home. So as I said, I joined this department too late to get to know Ben well, but I am very honored to have had the chance to have met him, and I'm similarly honored to share his truly inspirational story with everyone here today. Each year since 2000, 
So this is now our 22nd Slomoff Lectureship. Um, we've held this event, which has been every year one of the most exciting events of the year. Uh, and we've had some really outstanding figures in the field of conflict resolution and peace building give the Solmoff Lectureship um, in that time, including some of the uh, best known social psychologists in the conflict resolution field, Morton Deutsch and Herb Kelman, Senator George Mitchell, Dennis Ross, John Marks of Search for Common Ground, Christiana Figueres, Executive Secretary of the UN Framework for Climate Change, Frida Parsi, Founder and President of the National Iranian American Council, and many more. So Dr. Mohammed, you are joining a distinguished roster of Slomov lecturers. We're joined today on Zoom by Adam Green, one of Ben's grandsons, and joined in person by another of his grandsons, Brian Green, by Ben's great granddaughter, Anique Green, who is following in his footsteps and is a student at UMass Boston, and by their longtime family friend and another generous supporter of our program, Nancy Sonnebent. Thank you so much, Adam, Brian, Anique, and Nancy for joining us today. We're also joined by Dean Kiki Adozi, who I'll now say a few words about. Uh, Dean Adozi joined UMass Boston in 2017 as a professor in our department, and at that point is Associate Dean of the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. In summer 2021, she was appointed Interim Dean of the McCormick School, and in that position has led us through two, nearly two, very busy and productive years. Dina Dozy came to us from Michigan State University, where she spent a number of years as a faculty member in international relations and African affairs, and was also director of African American, African American and African Studies. She is the recipient of numerous honors and is very widely published. Her most recent book, her ninth, I believe, <laughs> Africa's New Global Tol Politics, Regionalism and International Relations, was published just this past year. And in addition to everything else, she continues to mentor and advise students in our program. It's an honor to have you here with us today, Dina Dozy. Please join me in welcoming Dina Dozy. Thank you so much, um, Professor Ross, for your generous introduction and for your service this year as director of the Conflict Resolution Program uh, here at the McCormick School. Um, welcome to Ben's family as well, online and uh, in person. Uh, welcome, it's such a joyous event uh, once a year. Um, today's 2023 um, Benjamin and Sylvia Slumoff and Judith Green loose lectureship in conflict resolution. It's an opportunity to celebrate the program's faculty for their excellent research and outreach um, in the city of Boston and all over the world. Um, Professor Ross, your own uh, topple research um, on the Peace Data Initiative that aims to gain insights into the process of scaling up the work of grassroots peace building endeavors and nonviolent movements for social change has had significant impact on uh, bringing peace to the world. Professor Q uh, is now here for his um, democracy work and civil society work in. Africa, including his latest initiative um, in uh, Africa on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, democracy initiatives uh, in the continent. Um, Professor Pugh for his um, SEMPROC uh, Center in Ecuador uh, and the Summer Institute of Conflict Transformation in border regions there. Lecturer Madawa Halapita, uh, whose work with faculty and with many students here um, in the department on developing early warning systems for conflict um, in the US through his CWAP project. And Professor Weitzman's many, several projects, but my favorite is his Beacon to Beacon program, consisting of a diverse group of um, uh, students and faculty who have experience with handling workplace, student faculty, student to student, uh, cultural and community conflicts and other um, services in conflict coaching, mediation, facilitation 
and understanding your options. Um, it's a pleasure um, to uh, stand here today as an interim dean to preside over the 22nd Slum of Loose Lectureship in Conflict Resolution, having enrolled at UMass Boston at the age of 78. Um, I say this story every time uh, to earn his bachelor's degree and finishing with a master's degree in dispute resolution in 1997 at the age of 85. Ben Slomov's legacy to us continues to remind us that education is a lifelong pursuit. These are the values that we recognize at the McCormick School of Policy and Global Studies. Uh, the Ben Slomov Lecture brings the greatest thinkers in mediation, international relations, diplomacy, and dispute resolution to our campus for an annual dialogue. And today's speaker um, continues in that tradition. He is Professor Khalil Gibran Mohammed, and I first connected with him about eight years ago when he was a professor at Indiana University, I think, and I was a professor at Michigan State University. He went on to become the president of the Schomburg uh, Library for Black Culture and History, um, and today he is a Harvard Kennedy School professor of history, race, and public policy, and works on bias education and the way that that can help individuals, institutions, and workplaces reconcile the past within the present and move towards greater equity together. Professor Mohammed's podcast um, that I have listened to is called Some of My Best Friends Are <laughs> and invites listeners into unfiltered conversations about growing up in a deeply divided country that we call the United States of America. Um, his slum of lecture today, however, is appropriately titled The Truth About Truth-Telling and Racial Justice, Field Notes from Northern Ireland, Rwanda, and South Africa. The talk presents preliminary observations um, from field work in these three countries that continue to engage in forms of state-sponsored truth-telling as a mechanism for reconciliation and or racial justice. Provost Joe Berger, who is our next welcome speaker, will provide a much more formal introduction of today's Slum of Lecturer, but I'd like to um, welcome by introduction um, our Provost Joe Berger. He is uh, UMass Boston's Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and he has been a member of the UMass Boston community since 2017, when he was appointed as Dean of the College of Education and Human Development, where he also holds an appointment as Professor of Education. He is a renowned and award-winning scholar whose credentials in these fields of global development and education are stellar, having received more than 62 million in funding for his work from agencies and foundations. Um, I could go on and on, but I'd like to uh, simply welcome everyone to today's lecture and welcome um, Provost Joe Berger to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Dina Dozy. It's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. And the Slomoff Lecture is a very important lecture, not just for the McCormick School, not just for the Conflict Resolution Program, but for UMass Boston and for the communities that we serve. Given the times that we live in, given the challenges of inequity, oppression, mass human displacement, human-driven climate change, ongoing economic and social unrest that have been exacerbated and laid bare by the recent pandemic, conflict resolution is more important than ever before. But it's been key for us to be able to develop as a society and community. And here at UMass Boston, where we have a long history since our founding of being, of being dedicated to equity, social justice, diversity, and inclusion, 
forms of social justice, it's particularly meaningful that we have a program in conflict resolution and particularly meaningful that we have a lectureship like this that draws attention to the constructive forward-looking ways that we must engage in together across our differences to address the very real challenges that matter to all of us right here locally on our own campus where we have no laurels to rest on, but also in the broader communities, locally, nationally, globally. You know, and in my career, I've had the privilege to be able to work in some of the societies and countries that have been most afflicted by conflict um, and discord. I've spent, um, many of you don't know, I've spent, I spent 16 years working with Af great colleagues in Afghanistan. I spent about two and a half years on the ground. I've worked in Somalia, I've worked in Palestine. And conflict resolution takes many forms, but at its heart, it's about how do we both at the micro and the macro level create vehicles of constructive change and transformation, not where we avoid our differences, not where we avoid those things that potentially divide us, but where we find those vehicles that can help us work through them, not to sacrifice our principles. No, actually to advance those things that we hold dear, but to do so in a way that bring others along. And I can't think of a more fitting speaker um, to honor us with this Lomoff lecture than our speaker here um, today. So it's a real honor to have our speaker, Khalil Gibran Mohammed, who has a long and distinguished career of addressing these very issues, both you know, as a scholar, but also as somebody who rolls up his sleeves and gets the work done, but does so in ways that have a very broad impact that resonates with so many. So he's currently the Ford Foundation Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He directs the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project and is the former director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library. And again, if you look at the times that we face, these are the issues that we are all wrestling with, that we are grappling with, that are long overdue, that we give attention to, um, at our university and in so many other places. His scholarship examines the broad intersections of racism, economic inequality, criminal justice, and democracy in US history. He's the co-editor of Constructing the Carceral State, a special issue of the Journal of American History. And he has a long list of other publications, forums, for which he's contributed to, including currently co-directing the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Sciences study on reducing racial inequalities in the criminal justice system. And it's not just the scholarship that he does, but um, he's used the rigor of his scholarly work in op-eds, in a whole variety of other media platforms to make sure that we're not just talking among ourselves that we're raising awareness more broadly for these issues. And so that we have an opportunity ourselves to learn from, to learn with, and to benefit from Dr. Mohammed's lecture today. On behalf of UMass Boston, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, this is my first time uh, to UMass Boston, and what a lovely campus. I, I can honestly say this is a top five uh, view for a lecture anywhere in the world. And I have lectured in Florence, uh, which is hard to beat um, in terms of giving a lecture. So thank you very much, Provost Berger, for your kind remarks. I certainly want to thank the Slomo family and the Green family uh, for uh, really contributing to the life of this institution and the great work of people who uh, are continuing to try to solve very difficult problems. To Professor Ross, thank you for uh, convening us here today, and most especially, Dean Adozi, uh, for your uh, friendship and leadership on these issues. 
And last but not least, Professor Samantha Lakin, uh, who uh, has contributed uh, to some of the work uh, in assisting my team uh, at the IRA project, the Institutional Anti-Racism Accountability Project. So um, first, a couple of disclaimers before I, I move on. I am a US trained historian. I spend very little time outside of the United States other than as a traveler. But as of late, I've been to four countries in Africa and two in the UK. Uh, and that's the work that brings me uh, to this topic. The reason I say that is because uh, I approach this work as an outsider. I approach this work as someone with a deep concern about the role of the United States in policing the pathways to either transitional justice or to reconciliation um, or to conflict resolution in countries all over the world. And as of late, the United States is not living up to its own principles and values, which is not new. But as of late, the problem has grown even more significant. And the extent to which this work itself really helps to explain what is possible both in other places and in the United States, to me, is what enriches um, the research that you will uh, see presented here. Uh, one last disclaimer, um, these are field notes. Uh, my team and I are in the process uh, of continuing to visit places. The team will be out uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma at the end of this week, which is the site of a racial pogrom in the United States uh, just about 100 years ago. Uh, and we will be visiting New Zealand virtually. Unfortunately, we won't make it there, uh, which will be the last of our site visits. Uh, so we have some work to do, uh, but I think there are some things that we can point to and share uh, that will contribute uh, to the traditions of the Slow Moth Lecture Series uh, that brings us here. So, so let's, uh, I hit the advance button, but it didn't move. I'll just use this. So I want to just uh, name the broader project in which today's uh, lecture sits. Uh, that project, Global Racial Justice, Truth-Telling, and Accountability, is part of a research team uh, that is sponsored by Kellogg Research. Some of you may know that the Kellogg Foundation has for more than 30 years been leading an effort of racial healing in the United States. They have invested map onto each other. So the Kellogg Foundation uh, supports this research in part with their own uh, mind to interrogate the fundamentals of this concept of racial healing. And the reason I mention that is because the countries that we are looking at uh, have a particular valence. Uh, timing is one of them, uh, countries that have more recently addressed these issues. Secondarily, uh, a, a more pro profound and uh, notable racial division uh, meaning that there are many ways in which conflict has proceeded uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, and one could say, to some degree, reducing those differences to some form of an identity marker is a common theme across the globe. Uh, but in particular, we were interested uh, in uh, about a half dozen countries, three of whom I will talk about today. Uh, we will add Canada, uh, New Zealand, and of course, the United States. So my colleague, Professor Gloria Yi, as well as uh, Erica Lick, who is our research director, have contributed significantly to this work that I will share uh, today. Additionally, and I don't mind raising my voice, although it may not overcome the distraction, um, the broad contours of this research are interested in the relationships uh, that uh, come with truth-telling. And in this circularity, uh, we're interested in both the degree to which the past is described, the past is remembered, the past is documented, 
forms of memorialization, that is the ways in which the public is made aware of these pasts, the context in which uh, redress occurs, and that is to say, how do we address systemic power, which of course drives much of the conflict in the world. One of the key themes of our research is the role uh, of colonialism and setting the conditions for conflict amongst these various uh, nations. And then finally, the policy space. What policy levers have been used in these various countries to address um, how to make sense of the past in order to move forward? How to redress the harm, the oppression, the domination, and various forms that it has taken in different parts of the world? Skip one. And so, uh, this won't be new to many of you as scholars in the room, but the degree to which uh, this is just a rough reminder of how we define various forms of truth-telling processes. Uh, my colleague, Professor Ayi, is a, a student of truth commissions in particular. Uh, and of course, many of us are familiar with the field of transitional justice for the purposes of truth finding, usually for some effort at prosecution. Uh, so with regard to the key components, recognizing and investigating those human rights violations, victims telling their stories, acknowledging the accounts of past abuses on the road to reconciliation, and then finally to make recommendations. Again, uh, the idea here being this is how we as researchers are setting out the parameters of what we are studying. And then the last uh, of some of the scaffolding of our work. Um, we've interviewed um, dozens and dozens of people in each of these countries. Uh, these interviews have been uh, deliberately focused uh, to look at all sides of these issues and at multiple levels of society, uh, from NGO, community and sector organizational leaders to government officials, scholars, architects of various forms of truth commissions and or peace accords, think tanks, and then museums, cultural archives, and memorial staff. Uh, as someone who is both a trained historian and also someone who ran a cultural institution that is in and of itself a site of memory uh, and a site of cultural preservation, uh, keenly sensitive to the relationship of how archives themselves are part of the process of reconciliation. So let me begin uh, with the case of Northern Ireland. I'm not going to spend our time relitigating the actual history because our work is about the present, the way in which the present retells the past. And one of the most striking aspects of the story of Northern Ireland is the unresolved trauma of the conflicts which began in the late 1960s. Uh, in a part of the uh, island of Ireland, Northern Ireland sits as part of the UK. It is an exception to the independence of Ireland since 1921. It has until quite recently been a Protestant dominant part of the island. Uh, everyone is Irish identified, uh, but as they will tell you on the ground in Northern Ireland, the Protestants are more British than the British. Uh, this is a country whose demographics have been quickly changing. Uh, uh, it has only recently become essentially a Catholic majority country. And with that, as well as the exit of, of England from the EU, significant processes of destabilizing much of the peace that came with the peace accords. By the standards of people on the ground there, the peace that came with the peace accords had a singular goal and success in mind, stopping the violence. But the infrastructure of that country, the ability of Northern uh, Ireland residents to fashion a collective understanding of the past has been the work of the past um, 25 years. And in that way, uh, you see tremendous instability amongst formerly paramilitary uh, groups in the country with regard to the failures ultimately to resolve some of the economic basis of change in that country. 
in this West Belfast community. If any of you saw Kenneth Branagh's film uh, named Belfast, which took a glossier view of things uh, in the present. Um, this is a community of low-income people uh, who are Protestant identified, a community dominated by both current um, people who still identify with paramilitary organizations and where this community to some degree was decimated by about 5,000 prosecutions that occur for those who had a direct part in the troubles uh, over that 30 year period. Part of the memorialization culture of Northern Ireland is muralization. It's a striking aspect of the country itself. And in this example, in this courtyard, you see this larger than life image of a fallen soldier of Protestant heritage, um, whose memory is the anchor, the cultural anchor of this community. You'll also notice uh, to the left of this image of this building is the image of two armed uh, paramilitary members pointing their weapons at the viewer. Um, it's even more to some degree menacing than it seems because the guns follow you as you pass. It's an optical illusion. On one hand, what is articulated here is the way in which for this Catholic, I'm sorry, for this Protestant community, memorialization means being able to tell their side of the victims of the people who fought the Protestant side of the battle. There is no single narrative in this story. And indeed, what is being passed on from one generation to the next of young people who were born after the troubles ended is a sense of grievance for the losses of a Protestant increasing minority who feel left behind. How is the state responding to this problem today? Not 10 years ago, not 15 years ago. The state today is responding with various efforts at restorative justice. Here in the same courtyard, in the same space, is this um, presentation of an organization called STARS, striving toward a restorative society. And here is the messaging, often paid for by government dollars, distributed to nonprofits as a way to stem what is effectively community violence. Because the structural violence that came with British occupation of the island, which morphed into Northern Ireland remaining part of the UK, led to fighting between essentially low-income to middle-income Protestants who had a stranglehold on the opportunities to be found in Northern Ireland, now resolved by a peace accord leaves this community still struggling with the structural violence of British colonialism. And so for these people, um, having little more than access to um, a essentially anemic nonprofit sector that is doing the best that it can to resolve the changing fortunes that have globalization have brought to Northern Ireland, where increasing numbers of immigrants uh, from other parts of the UK are taking the higher tech sector uh, positions here, as well as Catholic mobility uh, has fueling a kind of grievance. And this is what you might see on a typical bus stop um, in this neighborhood. Two older gentlemen uh, who represent somewhat the face of a low income, a Protestant community that once at the heyday of shipbuilding uh, in this industrial behemoth uh, for the UK and the British Isles um, would have had uh, far better economic prospects than they have today. Instead, what is being fueled uh, by this sense of loss and grievance in this moment through this muralization culture, through this version of their storytelling is an idea that they have to take back their country. We seek nothing but the elementary right implanted in every man, the right if you are attacked to defend yourself. And indeed, in this portion of West Belfast, one finds the um, present threat of community violence significant enough that when my colleague and I were on the ground, uh, a gentleman with a yellow vest was sure to accompany us 
uh, just to signal that we were outsiders, uh, that we were not to be harmed. And I must tell you, that was the first and only time uh, in Northern Ireland where I, where I felt a little bit uneasy about where we were. Um, just around the corner from uh, that uh, mural is this one. Uh, this is, again, part of the memorialization culture through murals where Protestants tell their story of loss. Um, one can think of, just as I am thinking as a scholar of the United States, of the way in which Confederate memorialization plays out in this country and has so, done so for uh, roughly 150 years. Um, there is, at this point, remaining no single narrative with which to try to bring closure to this. Um, but I'll say one more point on this uh, before I move to the but. Um, in this same area, uh, this is what uh, the Brexit moment looks like uh, for Northern Ireland. This is the uh, narrative of keeping the European Union out of the business of, uh, of England and of Northern Ireland. Now, why does the EU matter? The EU matters in this particular story of truth telling because the EU has been the primary mechanism for holding the uh, politicians uh, of Northern Ireland accountable for ensuring that there be no continued discrimination against the Catholic minority over the past 25 years, which again, it's very important to note that minority status is changing very rapidly and demographically no longer exists. This is an important insight for us. The relationship of the international community, in this case, the European Union, as a primary mechanism for enforcing uh, the recommendations of the peace process to ensure that Catholics would no longer be subjected to the kinds of systemic discrimination and violence that they experience at the hands of both uh, the Ulster community as well as uh, uh, English uh, army officials um, is now unraveling in the wake of Brexit. The challenge of Brexit is challenging the capacity of the European Union to hold Northern Ireland accountable. Now, the extent to which it will be absorbed, which many experts say is potentially uh, a fait accompli, um, will of course change that and the EU will uh, come back into play. But make no mistake about it, the larger context in which right-wing movements, uh, neo-Nazism uh, themselves sit at the base of the Protestant community of Northern Ireland remains an ever-present larger global issue that is unfolding in many countries of the West as we speak. On the other side, if you've been to Northern Ireland, of course, as Joe Biden uh, was just there, as, uh, and many have been in the past. These are the peace walls. Uh, this is the part of the country uh, where um, the line separating a historic Catholic community uh, from the Protestant community um, required uh, security. In this uh, small sample of the peace wall, the gates that rise 30 feet into the air were meant to limit the ability of uh, Protestants uh, standing just behind me as the photographer uh, would throw incendiary devices over to bring harm uh, and terror to those who lived behind those walls. On the other side of those walls are the opposite stories, the murals of Catholics who fell during the Troubles. Uh, and as is true on the other side, each one is named, uh, date of birth, and a story that reminds people of the commitments and the bravery and the resistance and the unequaled in the history of our struggle. We, the Republican ex-prisoners of the greater Clonard, salute you and your reward will only be a united Ireland. Also fascinating, uh, aside from this muralization culture that is competing versions of both sides are the ways in which on the Catholic side, the global justice movement also brings in solidarity claims uh, for shared interest across the Atlantic. Uh, in this case, 
under a Sinn Féin poster, one finds a quote by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And in fact, just down the road from here uh, is a huge global peace solidarity mural which centers um, the African-American and black freedom struggle at the center of which is Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, uh, John Lewis, Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Geronimo, and of course, uh, recently installed uh, Barack Obama. The struggle for South Africa, as I said to you before, uh, is a source of ongoing inspiration uh, for those on the Catholic side uh, who see their struggle as the uh, larger struggle for global justice more generally. They see themselves ultimately as the victims uh, who merit uh, solidarities with people from around the world. Moving to a part of Northern Ireland, uh, which is in the northeastern tip of the island is Londonderry or Derry. This is the part of Northern Ireland uh, that uh, was the site of Bloody Sunday in 1969, uh, when a group of peaceful marchers uh, set out to draw attention to the systemic racism. The Catholics in that overwhelmingly Protestant area, Catholics were about 10% of the population of Derry as compared to 90% Catholics. Uh, they had all the markings of systemic discrimination in housing, education, electoral politics, and so on and so forth. Fascinatingly, they took inspiration from the civil rights movement, which by that time had ultimately led to uh, the progress of the 64 and 65 bills. Um, they could not see then that we would have our own resolved problems and unfinished business uh, with regard to uh, the ways in which systemic racism was not addressed uh, by the civil rights legislation. Nevertheless, you see here um, evocations of a kind of transatlantic civil rights movement, one man, one vote, jobs, not creed. Indeed, when this museum, uh, which is a museum in Derry dedicated to that particular freedom struggle, uh, was opened by Reverend Jesse L. Jackson Sr. in 2017. Inside uh, the museum, uh, again, part of the broader museum truth-telling memorialization culture of this country, uh, we see again the way in which the language of the civil rights movement helped to inform their own struggle. These are uh, the tools of domination. And then again, uh, no surprise to us, the story of Bloody Sunday. Before we leave Northern Ireland, a couple things to say about the actual interventions used in this case. While it is clear that the state uh, has taken a uh, funding role in creating the conditions of possibility for truth telling um, amongst various sides of this conflict, the state's primary role has been to ensure political peace, to ensure that, that violence would not follow political differences. What the state has also done as funded a number of organizations that bring, quote unquote, both sides together. Unlike we will talk about in just a moment for the case of Rwanda, there is not a state recognized version of victims and perpetrators or survivors and perpetrators. These nonprofit organizations create the conditions for people for various communities at the localists of levels to come together and tell their stories. And a number of books have been published about the effectiveness of this process. Because there was death on both sides, because uh, as we've seen in the way these murals tell these stories, uh, people lost innocent uh, family members uh, who were not conflict involved, uh, but something terrible happened on a day. Um, talking to Catholics on the side of the issue, they say that it was very difficult initially to be in these conversations with Protestants, uh, but that uh, in sitting in those spaces, they realized how valuable it was for them. And the same, of course, is true on the Protestant side. I'll have to tell you, uh, as a African-American whose people descend from the enslaved and the West Africans who uh, were taken many, many centuries ago, it's kind of hard to, it was hard, I should say, when I first told this to imagine what that looks like uh, today. Uh, but I think it's a powerful lesson for the possibility of change at the community level, 
which is precisely what the Kellogg Foundation hoped to do uh, with its racial healing support. As we move to Rwanda, uh, we have a very different story. Uh, we have a country uh, whose uh, conflict derives most immediately uh, from the relationship of World War I and the transfer of power from the Germans to the Belgians, uh, who mapped onto previous distinctions of Hutu and Tutsi, which essentially mapped onto those who were farmers versus those who owned cattle. In other words, a social uh, hierarchy and social status that could be attached to uh, about 18 original clans uh, that were led by various chiefs um, were heterogeneous populations. Uh, they contained members who were self-identified Hutus and Tutsi. Hutus have always been uh, the majority population, as you would expect in any primarily agricultural society. When the Belgians arrived, uh, they began to use the science of racial classification. They imposed a Hamitic theory of domination, uh, which uh, essentially meant that the Tutsi uh, were more advanced, closer to Europeans, and were the natural born uh, rulers. Uh, by 1959, or shortly there uh, before, the Tutsi leaders began to uh, resist the uh, influence and impact of the Belgians on their society. And as a result, the Belgians decided that they would uh, arm and support the Hutus who felt their own sense of grievance uh, given the legacies of racial classification and the notion that they were permanently inferior as a population rather than people who happened to be farmers who might they one, one day be cattle uh, persons. That led to not one genocide in 1994, but seven genocides. Today, Rwanda is uh, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Uh, it is uh, the smallest African nation, but it is also the most densest by population. It is roughly 95% cultivated by land, uh, but as many will tell you, uh, it is one of the safest and most built infrastructurally sound uh, countries in the global south. Uh, this explanation for this is essentially a combination of its own economy and Western development support that uh, stays in the country. Um, I'm not gonna quote the amount, uh, the percentage of money that stays, but um, colloquially, some people say that roughly 90 to 95 cents of every dollar uh, stays in the country with regard to supporting um, the economy of Rwanda, uh, meaning that there's very little corruption uh, in Rwanda today. Unlike Northern Ireland, um, the government of Rwanda has taken a, a much more autocratic um, approach, a command and control approach to telling the history of the genocide. Um, it has a, established a national memorial, and so rather than a kind of a very liberalized, laissez-faire memorialization culture that we find in Northern Ireland. Here we find the state making significant investments in a single narrative, a single narrative that is described as the genocide against the Tutsi, not the Rwandan genocide. And by foreclosing the complexity of the genocide itself, which also included the loss of life to people who were uh, Hutu moderates uh, and, and those who fought against genocidaires uh, who were identified as Hutus, who were threatened with their losing their lives if they did not support the genocide, today continues uh, to be suppressed speech. Uh, the government of Rwanda has made it a crime to speak out against the government. We had a number of conversations with people uh, who said, Essentially, if I were to say this uh, and be overheard, I'd be in jail, including former government, government officials. Um, this is a complexity worth considering. I'll just add one more anecdote. Uh, when I pulled up to the Kigali Genocide Memorial, uh, I took picture here, um, but the next two pictures I took were deleted from my phone by security forces who saw me taking pictures. Um, so it's a very real, uh, situation. 
but it comes with some messiness that I think is worth leaning into. Um, at the memorial, roughly 250,000 uh, people uh, who died during the genocide are permanently interned. Um, it is a massive site of memorialization for the victims of the genocide. Uh, roughly 800 to a million people uh, were killed in a roughly three month period beginning in April of 1994. And uh, it's just important to note that there's been no other uh, form of efficient killing uh, in the history of the world, given the number of people who died under such a short period of time. To that extent, the complexities of the autocratic forms of leadership of the current Kagame government um, make some sense. Uh, Rwanda has about 40 million people as refugees uh, who live outside of the country. As I've already said, the majority of those people um, now identify as Hutus. In the past, they identified as Tutsi because those were the people who were facing persecution over long periods of time. The region remains unstable. And therefore, the security force is no different than our own security forces that for me, for example, 20 years ago, I couldn't catch a plane uh, without going through uh, additional screening uh, simply for uh, having a name, Khalil Duran Muhammad, um, shouldn't present ourselves as uh, so much above reproach for the challenges to our own civil liberties that exist in the post 9-11 world in this country. Um, on the point, though, of truth telling, the country of Rwanda has created the conditions for a, a more sophisticated understanding of the nature of the conflict, rather than blaming Hutus for the violence, they blame colonialism. They blame the role of the West in creating the conditions that led to genocide. They also do this within the space of this official site of memorialization by broadening the understanding of various forms of colonialism that exist in many parts of the world. And as someone who studies colonialism, I take most of what they say to be an accurate depiction of the way in which colonialism has shaped the uh, conditions for conflict in many parts of the world. That's important. It's important because at the same time, Rwanda, more than any of the three places that I'll talk about today, has invested tremendous energy, effort, and learning about what actually happened in that country and are committed to building an infrastructure of national civic unity uh, that is not just an empty building with a few bureaucrats inside, uh, but very thoughtful researchers, many of whom have been educated in the West and the United States in particular, uh, to try to bring what they can to the unfolding story of what's happened in that country. Part of that also includes the fact that for the first time, some of those convicted um, through uh, both a court process, which produced very few formal prosecutions, and a gachacha process, which was a community-based uh, form of prosecution, which ultimately led to about 120,000 people being incarcerated. Many of those people uh, will soon re return to civil society. Many of the young people who were convicted under this process have already been released. Young people today are growing up in a Rwanda having to wrestle with the fact that they lost parents or that their parents have been incarcerated and what does that mean to them? Which means not unlike Northern Ireland, the evolving nature of the histories that have unfolded in this country, the trauma and conflict and genocide that they've experienced will produce new challenges in the near future. On the grounds of the memorial, uh, you will see um, the ways in which individuals come to remember their loved ones. Uh, most of the enclosures that contain people uh, do not have a visible coffin, uh, but as you can see, the documentation process to name those who were lost. Uh, they have a flame that will never extinguish. And of course, young people on field trips are brought there to learn this story. The state even insists that no heads of state or diplomats from any part of the country, I did not verify this, um, come to the Kigali National Memorial before they meet with uh, state officials uh, or the president. Uh, 
So again, unlike Northern Ireland, their commitment to a narrative, even if constrained by a closed society or security state, um, has produced stability in this country around a shared narrative of colonialism as the root of the problem. We'll come back to that later. Along the countryside, the sites of memorialization extend in all directions, from Kigali to surrounding communities. Uh, you may happen upon, as uh, we did, this site of memorialization, Kwibuku uh, 28, uh, and Samantha actually speaks Kenny Rwandan, so she'll correct me if I get any of this wrong, um, is the 28th anniversary of the genocide uh, for 2022 uh, when we were there. And uh, they have essentially created small graveyard sites um, around the countryside because so many people died. There were so many bodies everywhere and ultimately so many mass graves that for the state, the decision was to use these sites as a constant reminder of what happened. There are places uh, in uh, the further reaches of Rwanda where the skeletons and remains of people um, rest uh, for eternity in the physical landscape of the land that have grown over and to become a kind of surreal um, representation of the genocide. Yet and still, the commitment uh, to the outward face of this history is definitely undeniable. Um, this is one individual who helps us to appreciate the very specific mechanism that the state has supported, but is not leading um, on the way in which community dialogues proceed. Um, this is the le leader of an organization called Civilta. Um, her first name is Godelieb, and Godelieb has been responsible for about 75,000 forms of reconciliation, uh, starting with her own village, where in the specific contours of the Rwandan genocide, neighbors killed neighbors, relatives killed relatives, friends killed friends. And because of the specific context in which Hutu and Tutsi always lived together, um, the pain of loss and the not knowing of what happened to loved ones, even when you knew who killed your loved one, um, has been the work of Godelieb and Savota. Savota started with women as survivors of both the actual genocide and in some cases of rape itself, survivors of the loss of loved ones, and recognized that there was really no effort early on for those survivors uh, to heal, uh, to come to terms with the trauma that they experienced. But she soon recognized that the men in their lives could not be left unaddressed. And then she recognized that the perpetrators who were returning back to their uh, ancestral and home villages could not be addressed. And so Savota today brings all of those uh, people uh, together. And again, it's almost in its spirit and form identical to some of the same conversations we had with nonprofit NGOs who do this uh, community-based dialoguing. Here is Savota describing her work. She recommended a young man, uh, and I apologize, I don't have his name in my notes. She recommended a young man uh, who we spoke to, who today is in his late 30s, uh, but at 13 years old, as he told us, he killed several people. And um, our project is IRB based, um, so it's okay to show it because uh, for him and so for so many others, they want their stories to told. He wanted us to know what he'd done. And he wanted us to know that if it were not for Civilta, were for it not for the ability for him to come to terms with what he'd done, he would not be the person he is today. One of the most powerful stories in our research coming from this young man is that the need for healing amongst survivors means that his relationship with the victims of his crimes depend upon him regularly to come back and pay them visits. Not only because he helped them to, to bring closure to them for what happened to their loved ones, to help discover their remains, 
but that he is the closest living embodiment of their loved ones, which frankly, uh, again, challenges the way in which uh, many of us as Americans in a very punitive society um, think about the relationship to those who have brought so much pain and suffering. He kept insisting over and over again, I know this is hard to believe. I know you won't believe me. Please come, please come to the village so you can see for yourself. We were not able to take him up on his offer, but in the broader sense of things, we heard this story told in many other contexts. And so finally, to give some uh, evidence, context for the kind of academic basis for this work, um, the way in which the state is supporting academic research. Um, we met with the Institute of Research and Dialogue for Peace. It is one of many aspects of the relationship of the academic community and the national government to documenting their peace process. This is uh, the new building uh, for the National uh, Center for uh, Civics and Unity, which again for Rwanda is an important uh, beachhead for managing their process. Look, make no mistake about it. This is not an open society in the sense. This is still a security state, but in the trade-off between an open society and stability, Rwanda is an incredibly stable society. Many of its leaders who are even critical of Kagame, who felt that Kagame should have stepped down after his second term, still believe that leadership for Rwandans is the whole story. So leaders can be good and leaders can be bad. And I'm not here to pass judgment at this time as to what we should make of Rwanda's choices. I am here to suggest to you that the mechanisms that they are using for truth-telling are better than my next example, which will take us to South Africa. South Africa may indeed be uh, the most well-known of these examples. And indeed, uh, that picture's out of place, because that's, no, that's not out of place. But the story of uh, South Africa is also the story of Europe in Africa. It is uh, the place where since 1652, uh, Dutch uh, traders landed in uh, the Cape of Good Hope, established Cape Town, uh, and established uh, forms of settler colonialism that we recognize in many parts of the colonized world. Uh, they first established chattel slavery, they then eventually dispossessed the Khoi and San indigenous tribes of the region, and ultimately from the 1600s, uh, well until the 19th century, um, took uh, increasing possession of land, eventually putting them in the crosshairs of Britain, uh, who had their own claims, or at least sought their own claims. This led to a series of wars, which also involved the Zulu, who famously beat the British, broad strokes history here, bear with me folks. Why this matters though, is because while Europeans still represent less than 10% of the population of South Africa, uh, for the remaining populations of both Bantu descended people, uh, as well as people who come from Indonesia, uh, from Mozambique, uh, from other parts of the Indian uh, diasporic world, who today we call colored, uh, who self-identify as Malay, are a mixed race people uh, representing the presence of Europeans and the forms of migration, uh, of kidnapping, and of slavery uh, that evolved over the course of those uh, 250 years before the 20th century and before we get to apartheid. And so the wealth of the West in South Africa is uh, blatant and distinct relative uh, to much of the rest of Africa. South Africa has the second largest economy behind Nigeria, but unlike Nigeria, which is an extractive economy tied to petroleum, South Africa uh, is home to multinational corporations uh, that dot the landscape of corporate parks between Johannesburg and Pretoria, just like you would expect to see on the New Jersey Transit, I'm sorry, New Jersey Turnpike, uh, not too far from where I live. This is a country since 1994 
that has been led by uh, the black government of the African National Congress and uh, has installed five presidents. The constitution itself has been a model constitution uh, in lifting up the values of liberal democracy and an open society. And indeed, I bore direct witness to the way in which dissent is acceptable and acknowledged. I both talked to those actively engaged in protesting the current government of South Africa, as well as government officials, uh, both uh, who served in a, a current role of monitoring corruption within the government, as well as being accountable to community organizations like Kulamani, uh, who are protesting the failures of the Truth Commission to address reparations in that country today. So what is it that South Africa is doing about memorialization? What does that look like? This is uh, the entry uh, to the uh, prison fort number four, which is located on Constitutional Hill, which is the same home to the Constitutional Court, which is South Africa's Supreme Court. What is fascinating about this is this site of memorialization is both a mashup of the past, the present, and the future. They took the site of one of the places of torture and pain and punishment where Black South Africans were arrested for their political dissent, kept the uh, prison itself as a museum and built its Supreme Court on top of it. And in that way, it's a brilliant way of reminding uh, the people of this nation that its future is tied directly to its past. And this is what those grounds look like. Uh, this is a public art display uh, showing the process of uh, socialization for those who came inside uh, prison uh, number four. Um, their heads are missing because um, colonialism, to destroy the body, you take the mind. Uh, these are the sites of solitary confinement where prisoners were kept. And just beyond the prison itself uh, is uh, an eternal flame of democracy with the preamble to the Constitution inscribed on the bricks. But what a powerful moment of contradiction to stand in this place, unlike Rwanda, uh, where one would never find what you are about to see, uh, just behind this image were these people protesting what they called the unfinished business of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And they cite, speaking of the ways in which climate change is exacerbating the legacies of colonialism, COVID, floods, gender-based violence, poverty, crime, inequality. For them, these forms of structural violence and neglect are direct legacies of apartheid and colonialism and yet, because the victims of apartheid have not had redress, they find themselves um, protesting to this very day. This woman, uh, Noma Russia Bonasse, uh, is helping to lead this organization of largely low-income, older uh, persons, both men and women, although largely uh, women-led. And the short version here is that the TRC only acknowledged about 22,000 victims of apartheid who were direct victims of police or state violence. Uh, the process uh, was narrowly conceived um, for the purposes of doing something rather than taking on the enormity of the victims. As you know, Desmond Tutu led this process. Um, but a couple of notable failures of which are acknowledged by the government and have not been resolved. And you can find on the walls of just about any museum that you encounter in South Africa. The problems are that uh, very few people who were identified by those 22,000 victims were in fact prosecuted and punished. Secondly, for those who sought amnesty as perpetrators, very few white people came forward to seek amnesty. And thirdly, many people who were parts of the uh, South African police and military forces are to this day paid pensions from the black government of South Africa in spite of never seeking um, any form of amnesty to participate in the process, nor being held accountable. In fact, there are just as many, if not more, 
A and C members who have been subjected to prosecution and more who sought amnesty uh, for telling what they did usually to people uh, who were considered informants uh, by the white uh, South African or Afrikaner government. Part of the uh, grievances that are legacy effects of the TRC process have also to do with the fact that there were promises for land distribution as well as community reparations to ensure uh, that there would be clean water, uh, that there would be electrification, that there would be uh, good schooling and educational opportunities. If you spend time in South Africa today, you will recognize that much of that has not occurred. And it is people like uh, Noma Russia who are on the front lines of making that battle. Here at the University of South Africa, uh, she spoke again. We met her on Constitutional uh, Hill, not recognizing that we would actually see her uh, days later because she's just that important to this uh, battle. And so while the uh, traditions or the young traditions of liberal democracy create the space for dissent and acknowledgement for people to express their concerns, nevertheless, nevertheless, the lights still go out in South Africa due to load shedding. Uh, and so for the poor of that country who are living under conditions in various townships, including Soweto, that parts of which don't look much different than they looked 30 years ago, the mechanism for change under a black government um, seems to still be wanting. The process of memorialization, while more honest, seems to not have led to justice. And yet some of the contradictions are powerful to witness up close. This is Golden Reef City, which is home to an amusement park and a casino. But that amusement park and casino sit on the land of one of the first gold mines uh, in South Africa. And adjacent to uh, this early gold mine is the Apartheid Museum uh, to this day, which takes some of its inspiration from the US Holocaust Museum on the National Mall, including being randomly assigned a ticket upon entry as to whether you are white or non-white. I think the museum as museums go is uh, both encyclopedia, encyclopedic and effective. Uh, there is a lot of truth telling uh, in South Africa's uh, museum and memorialization culture, including uh, what I found uh, very important is the degree to which the heterogeneity of political philosophies amongst Black South Africans and the differences between Stephen Biko and Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mandela and so many others um, are told and told in unflinching ways. There is something about the embrace of memorialization culture here um, that is both powerful and also limiting. I did forget to mention one important thing about uh, Rwanda, which matters to this point. Rwanda has attempted to solve its problem, uh, not just through a single narrative, it has also attempted to solve its problem through universal health care and forms of social provision that mitigate extreme forms of poverty in that country. Whereas once they uh, conscripted people to do street sweeping, uh, today uh, those people are paid. And so while it is a poor country, it is a poor country uh, that recognizes the relationship between economic need and structural violence uh, both the legacies of which, as well as the ongoing concerns and resentments borne by it as a way to mitigate future violence. South Africa has not done the same thing. And so even as these stories of political prisoners, you can see Stephen Biko memorialized in the museum. Um, this is a national museum for the country that's in Pretoria. Um, we're not gonna go inside, but what I want you to see is the relationship of the National Museum in Pretoria uh, to a shanty community that sits at the foot of the museum. Inside the museum, again, some of those stories um, are very striking uh, for the way in which they don't shy away from even the issue of communist influence in the ANC, uh, as well as violence uh, by the ANC at the point at which Nelson Mandela himself became a target of the US CIA, which of course, Many of us know the CIA is ultimately responsible for the discovery of Nelson Mandela before he was taken into custody and put on trial. Of course, um, in South Africa, Paul Kruger, 
uh, one of the uh, Afrikaner leaders of this country for whom the uh, national park is named for Kruger National Park, um, was subjected to some uh, political dissent uh, in the era of Black Lives Matter. Protesters attempted to remove Kruger from his pedestal, which is why you see uh, the gate around it. Of course, this is a part of the contested terrain of South Africa's own reckoning with its um, uh, apartheid and colonial past with regard to these new narratives of the future. And here, I think one of the most powerful lessons uh, for us is to understand how Nelson Mandela has been memorialized as a singular figure. He is as close to the version of Dr. Martin Luther King who stands on the National Mall today as a kind of monumentalized version of a, in this case, a rainbow nation, or in the American case of the uh, American exceptionalism. Uh, in both cases, the voice of a Mandela has been uh, limited to simply a smiling old man uh, who fathered uh, this great nation. And one of the ironies of where this image of Nelson Mandela sits at the foot of the union buildings, which is the parliament for uh, South Africa and Pretoria, um, is at the foot of his uh, large monument is an occupation by Khoi and San people um, who have been out there for more than a year to hold the ANC accountable for uh, giving land back to those communities that lost it. And here you can see uh, what that looks like in reference to Nelson Mandela. And so this contradiction is powerful uh, in terms of widening the scope of what has not been fundamentally redressed as compared to acknowledged. Um, Nelson Mandela uh, is even notable for the Nelson Mandela Mall in Santon, which is one of the richest places in all of Africa. Uh, apparently it has more millionaires per square mile than any other part of Africa. And at this mall is another monumentalized vision or version of Nelson Mandela. But it gets even stranger because as you walk the corridors of this mall, um, he becomes almost a cartoonish figure. Uh, here's one version of him. Here's another version of him. And here he is uh, with Winnie. I happen to be at this mall with young people um, who represent Gen Z perspective and simply say that Nelson Mandela is no longer a hero to them uh, because they feel like he, and I'm paraphrasing here, sold out the country by not holding white people accountable uh, for what happened to them and that they gave away too much in the negotiated settlement, which the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, was the, ultimately the chief negotiator and now president of this country. People will disagree. The point is not that people will disagree. The point is that this resentment exists amongst those young people because these issues have not been solved for. And yet, on any given day, one might be swayed by the image of Nelson Mandela's famous Rainbow Nation, uh, where in Cape Town, most especially, uh, you can see at a local mall and tourist location, the image of young black and white uh, playing together. And so finally, uh, for South Africa, uh, Cecil B. Rhodes uh, Memorial still stands despite the movement uh, that Rhodes must fall. Um, and as you well know, the British imperialist who had a vision of connecting South Africa to Northern Africa, um, who helped to commercialize the discovery of diamonds uh, and for whom today inspires Rhodes scholars all over the world, um, represents the competing histories um, of this pre-apartheid South Africa and this post-apartheid South Africa. But some of those changes are unfolding. Uh, this is once the site, uh, this is the University of Cape Town. Um, this uh, hall has been renamed Sarah Bartman Hall uh, for the name of a Khoi San a woman who became a, a international exhibit of the uh, exceptional uh, inferiority of black people for her body parts uh, upon her death. Uh, her body was um, uh, preserved and put on display in museums around the world uh, to emphasize the distinctiveness of African inferiority. These are young people at a young UCT today. 
this is the face of poverty in that place, uh, represented by Soweto in this image. And then finally, um, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. Why do I end here for South Africa? As I said to you, in Northern Ireland and Rwanda, both sides come together with imperfect results. In South Africa, white people don't come to the table of reconciliation. White people have not been asked to come to the table of reconciliation. They've been given a free pass in the interest of reconciliation, in the interest of moving forward. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission process was meant to do that work, a one-time offer. Even F.W. de Klerk famously said, until the Truth Commission process, he didn't know what was going on, which if you're like me, find that impossible to believe. But the performance of ignorance, or as James Baldwin would say, innocence, um, remains a source of tremendous inequality in this country because whites still hold the land and the economic power. And to the extent that we can debate, um, still hold political power because of that economic influence and the limitations of the black governments, and I put plural on that because the ANC may never be possible, capable of overcoming its own choices and corruption, but there are competing black uh, organizations, including the EFF, um, who are trying to gain power, but they will not gain power as long as the West has a stranglehold on the economic resources. To close uh, for South Africa, two white people are leading much of this work here. They're trying to get white people to the table. They're having limited results. But one of them told a powerful story of why he enters into that work. He's about 40 years old. And he said when he was 11 years old, his uncle who had fought uh, for the South African army in Angola uh, to fight against the Angola freedom movement, came home with a skull with a bullet in his head as a trophy of the kill that he'd made uh, on the battlefields of Angola, representing the interest of white Europeans uh, in Southern Africa. And he said, as a child, no one ever talked to him about the trauma that he experienced being exposed to that violence. And that that's the work he hopes to do today because for the 10% of the population that is white has never come to the table of reconciliation. And hence the future of South Africa seems to be somewhat more uncertain as it has not yet dealt with the legacies of colonialism and apartheid besides a truth commission process. We didn't interview a single person who said that the United States should follow what they've done. And let me close then where we started. Some of you know that the Congresswoman Barbara Lee and the Senator Cory Booker have called for a U.S. Truth Commission. Uh, and just like the House bill that John Conyers, the late John Conyers, proposed beginning in 1977 called H.R. 40, remains in committee, uh, has never been brought to a full vote uh, of Congress, uh, so too is this idea yet still simply on paper. And yet this truth Racial Healing and Transformation Commission is a direct legacy and in conversation with the Kellogg Foundation's own work. But if I were to tell you the version of history for the United States that matches, or at least is in conversation with Northern Ireland, Rwanda, and South Africa, this is what it would look like. First, we'd start with the end of the conflict. We'd start with the peace. We'd start with the end of the Civil War. And as early as 1866, a version of how Confederates were telling the story of what comes next was a story of the federal government empowering the Negro at the expense of the white man. That the resistance to political freedom, to a justice and truth made right by the legacies of 245 years of slavery was already immediately under attack. And for those of you who know the history of the United States know that Reconstruction was roughly a 10 year period of federal occupation, which brought with it new constitutional amendments in response to this very resistance. And yet 
when we look at memorialization culture in the United States, what we see here is that most of the history of the Civil War was taken up by the Confederate side of history. Most of the history of what happened during slavery and what happened after slavery was not a story of national unity. And it certainly wasn't uh, a kind of command and control way in which Rwanda has done. It was left to a kind of laissez-faire approach. And that laissez-faire approach, approach produced a narrative of white supremacy that became a nationalizing narrative. And where it disagreed with the Confederacy, it remained passive in the face of a new narrative assault in these monuments. You see this peak here occurring between 1890, which was one generation removed. Uh, the Daughters of the Confederacy led this effort to build monuments to their uh, fathers and grandfathers who had fought in the, the war uh, against the North, sorry. And here on the opposite side of that uh, peak, is about 1915, another generation later when the African-American community began to resist segregation. The second peak here, I'll just mention briefly, is the civil rights movement. In other words, with every moment of challenge to this country, Confederate monuments have gone up in this country. And the legacies of that means primarily that no matter where you are in this country, the truth of slavery and its legacies are poorly taught and understood by many Americans. The Southern Poverty Law Center did this study, and I'm only gonna to point to one thing here in the interest of time. On the question of slavery being the central cause of the Civil War, when you ask students, 8% um, of students understood that key concept. 58% of textbooks acknowledged it, and only 39% of state standards in this study acknowledged that slavery was a central cause of the Civil War. Imagine if we were talking about the teaching of the Holocaust in Germany, and only 8% of German students today uh, could say that the Holocaust actually happened, that it was directed against the Jews. It would be outrageous and the United States would be leading an effort to point it out. And so coming full circle to an issue such as reparations, the same issue that is on the table in South Africa for those who are fighting against the erasure of colonialism in terms of its impact on the present, um, your own colleagues as part of the UMass system have done some polling research uh, to look at how many Americans believe that reparations is a good thing. This uh, nearly half is weighted by the fact that most of the respondents voted uh, for Democrats. Um, and so the partisan divide on this issue uh, is incredibly striking. And so finally, um, if there is a pathway uh, to taking lessons from this period, that pathway runs through truth telling. That pathway runs through uh, coming up with a shared narrative of what happened in the past and a new memorialization culture that would replace the existing one. And yet 22 states have passed anti-CR2 bill bills in this country, which are bills against the teaching of race or gender, which are defined under most of these bills as divisive concepts that make white children feel bad about these histories. All but 44 states in the country have proposed various anti-CRT measures, which is to say that this problem is everywhere in this country today. And so there's no pathway to justice and a lasting peace that doesn't start with truth. And the truth about truth-telling is that it's hard. The truth about truth-telling is that we don't have a perfect model in the world about how to do it. But the truth about truth telling is if we don't figure it out and we don't take the best that we can from what we do already know, we're not going to be better off as we hand these various countries off to the next generation. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, Gina Jolison. Thank you. Thank you, um, Khalil, for such a, a I, I think, informative and enthralling, um, you know, lecture on, you know, truth-telling in three comprehensive uh, cases. Um, 
So I, I wonder if I can take issue with you on the Rwandan case. Uh, I know you know it's coming. Um, I mean, you know, some will say that indeed the, the country has not been able to tell the truth, um, or it's 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 um, reconciling, you know, through um, compulsion and authoritarianism and silences. Um, what, what, what do you say to that? Yeah. I say the jury's still out for me, and I'm just being transparent. Uh, so I'm not locked in uh, to a perspective. We've got a lot of writing to do, and you know writing is a form of commitment. Um, but I thought about this. Uh, I thought about this, I should say. And that is, if you're in the United States in the 1920s, when the latest Confederate monument has gone up, you live in an authoritarian society. You not only live in a society where white supremacy is celebrated in monuments, you live in a society where you can't vote. You live in a society where your political speech will cost you your life. You live in a society where your economic future is cast in stone by and large, unless you become a migrant. Stevenson de describes black people as refugees to the North. And so it doesn't mean that Rwanda's off the hook. It only means that the complexities of how we think about liberal democracy from a Western standpoint merits a bit more scrutiny about the heterogeneity that exists within our own societies um, that we are very quick to judge outside of them. And so when I make those commitments, I'll, I'll let you know, and I might even talk to you before I put them on paper. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Curry, for this presentation. My name is James Kinto. I am a doctoral student. I didn't hear you say. I'm a doctoral student here. Yes, yes. Yes, yes in global governance and human security. But I come from Uganda. Uh, we are the immediate neighbors of Rwanda. And as you were presenting this, I was looking at some scenario of a number of people who fled that genocide and went to their immediate neighborhood. A very big population is in Uganda. A good number of them are in, uh, in uh, uh, South Sudan, the Democratic, Republic, the the Democratic Republic of, of Congo and Burundi. Now, uh, since you are documenting about telling the truth, I was like, we need to look at a situation of a number of people who wish to be in Rwanda and be able to contribute to telling their story that they have no access. On the outside, it looks like it's democratic, it's free entry and exit into and out of Rwanda, but there are many Rwandans who can't enter Rwanda. They are not comfortable in the neighborhood they are because- one, they are not in, in kind of, they are not in refugee camps, but they live among the other people and they want to get back to Rwanda. They want to tell, they want to contribute to this truth. They want to, to, to also participate in the Kwibuka, which is a memorial. Have you in your process of documenting this sort of mechanisms, we can reach this type of people so they either also contribute from wherever they are or between government and the NGOs that can support their coming without having to fear that they will lose their lives because that is exactly what is going on. Yeah. Yes. It's a, it's a similar question as Dina Dozi, uh, which is to say that um, the trade-offs that the, that the current government of Rwanda has made are are sacrificing forms of dissent in terms of different narratives of what that truth might be. Um, so no, I, don't, I haven't solved for that problem. Uh, and I'm not 
trying to solve for that problem. Um, I guess the question really is, um, if you are, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it a slightly different way. Germany has hate speech laws, which by our standards would push Germany uh, further from the ideal um, than we claim. South Africa has hate speech uh, policies. Their equality law prohibits um, the rights of individuals to use racist slurs against other people. And as we know, in Colombia recently, a woman was prosecuted for referring to the vice president as an ape. Um, so again, I think that if we're honest about the world we live in, it isn't clear in the United States and in other places that unlimited speech um, guarantees what? Now, on the same token, um, the question that I'm trying to solve for is, um, if Rwanda has shifted the terrain away from litigating um, the multiple casualties uh, of the genocide to this history of colonialism, it's not perfect, and I'm not pretending that it is but it is a form of truth telling that works. Now, um, are all national narratives forms of elition and erasure? Yes. Question is, what do you want out of your national narrative? What Rwanda wants is stability, period. They are a small country. Um, they've, you know, if, if every Rwandan returned home, the country would probably not make it. Um, it's just a fact. Rwandan or Kini Rwandan is the, uh, either the first or the second most spoken language uh, in Africa, which most people don't know, they think of Swahili. Um, so I'm not trying to pass judgment and make, uh, you know, saying they've got it right. I'm just pointing out that these trade-offs lead to certain outcomes. So unlimited speech, unresolved truth-telling, produces forms of systemic oppression that remain a source of uh, tremendous premature death um, here in the United States. South Africa is telling a lot of truth in terms of its history, but it is not able or not willing or, or uh, unprepared to resolve the actual legacies that that truth points to. Um, Rwanda has solved a couple of immediate problems. It's a stable country and it is experiencing forms of poverty that are more dignified uh, than most countries can say for the global South. Are there costs to that? Absolutely. Have I figured out how to solve for those costs or what trade-offs they ought to move to go back in one direction or another? No. Am I skeptical of some of the blanket condemnation of Rwanda that comes from the West? Yes. I'm just sharing with you my perspective on this. Yes. Hello. Um, thank you once again um, for for your work, and then I've had an opportunity to see one of your presentations again. Um, and I appreciate having some understanding of your work. How you still maintain some optimism, you know, looking at the long view historically too. I was, um, you know, my work looks. Um, a lot at historical memory in New Orleans. And most recently, I've been looking at um, Canada, Vancouver as a city of reconciliation, and uh, Nova Scotia, and some of those communities. And I'm thinking about the way that, you know, both in New Orleans and a lot of places around the US that have been looking and paying more attention to the memorial culture, taking down monuments, maybe replacing monuments. Uh, the U.S. and its recent dedication of a national holiday for Juneteenth. But all of this, as you have pointed out, without the additional steps of any kind of redistribution and, and ways that you talked about Mandela um, potentially being used in similar ways to, as Dr. King, not just as a 
sort of uncomplicated celebratory figure that completely um, undermines the, the contentious uh, history that, that many of the group or the people that stood um, against many of the things that, that now those images are being lifted up. So do you see, I mean, and it seems like for you to be doing this work, you must have some sort of hope or vision for getting us from just the this rhetorical um, gestures towards inclusion and celebration of diversity to um, address the systemic issues that you reference in your talk. So I would like to hear about some of the maybe examples, even on the grassroots level, or what are the possibilities? What work do I need to be doing to, to help this to come along? Thank you. Yeah. So I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Louisiana and New Orleans, uh, because while I'm a Chicago native and uh, kind of third generation removed from the South, my people are from Georgia and Mississippi, um, but that goes back to my great grandparents. Um, I spent some time in Louisiana the last few years uh, reporting initially for the 1619 Project magazine. I wrote an essay on uh, the history of sugar uh, as a way of reflecting on uh, the unique way that Louisiana produced sugar cane, uh, unlike the cotton belt of Mississippi and other places. And then um, visited the Whitney Plantation and ultimately revised that essay for the 1619 Project book. So I've had a lot of... Um, time to think about Louisiana and its memorialization culture. And it's fascinating um, because part of what the Whitney Museum represents, the Whitney Museum, for those who don't know, is the only museum uh, in the country dedicated to the history of um, sugar slavery. Uh, and one of the few, if not, I'm not even sure there is another plantation museum dedicated to slavery in general. There are some artifacts at the National Museum of African American History. There's one in Cincinnati, the National Underground Railroad Museum, that lift slave cabins whole cloth, reinstall them inside the museum, so you get a sense of plantation life. But uh, unlike the Whitney Plantation, which is about 40 miles north of New Orleans, almost every plantation in the area, one is a huge um, movie set. It's not really a movie set. It is a common location for the shooting of films. You know this, I'm telling you your own place. Okay, and the others celebrate the lost cause and you know, sort of celebrating the Southern gentility and people get married at these places. So what's happening at Whitney is the seed of taking back the actual history of this country from the Confederate white supremacist narrative that has dominated the American educational landscape. Um, and the, the positives that have come with work like Whitney, which is uh, just one manifestation more recently, um, has been the commitment for various schools and states uh, to institutionalize a more academically informed version of the American past, not the one that is popular or that suits the emotional sensibilities of Americans. That's the good news. And that's the news that we need to keep making, which is to say that the answer to your question from my vantage point is that if we don't get our history right in our schools and socialization, then we can expect a different country, a country that ultimately comes to terms with this. Because let's just take South Africa out of the equation. South Africa's got 8% white population. Um, those kids will be educated in schools that protect their interests. Uh, in the United States, um, while the minority population is growing and has tipped in terms of babies who are non-white, um, white children are still educated overwhelmingly in public schools. They're the dominant population. And so if you can actually change the way that white children are socialized by how they learn about the past and just pick just, just pick the, the most celebrated, critically acclaimed historical scholarship. You don't have to do it according to Khalil Muhammad. You'll never have to pick up a book that I've written or, or read. Just 
because none of this stuff is hidden. It's not controversial. It is what it is. And yet that is the powerful antidote to the uh, problem of systemic and structural racism. It's the powerful antidote that explains why legislation to restrict those changes is afoot right now. And this response to that is not to shy away from it. The response is to make it plain what exactly is going on and to fight against it. It is anti-truth legislation. It is organized and legislated lies, period. It's, it's nothing more than that. And it's a playbook from fascism. It's, it's a playbook of propaganda. It's, it's, it's the same playbook that if you are uh, looking at the, this perspective of American history from the black perspective, it's the reason why the narratives of white supremacy showed up in textbooks all the way into the 1980s. Um, a colleague of mine at Harvard wrote a book called Teaching White Supremacy, Donald Yacobone, um, who looked at about 3,000 textbooks at Harvard to see how the story uh, of American history has been taught to most students over the past you know, 200 years. So I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. I, I know uh, we might imagine some other kind of like magical pill uh, or intervention that we can uh, impose from on high. But uh, to me, it's not, I won't say it's that simple, but you know, the metaphor I use is uh, if you have an injury and you need to go to physical therapy, the physical therapist, the only way that you can get healed is if the physical therapist works on the source of the pain. Um, if you shy away and you flinch and you say, don't touch me there, you, know, you may not have pain in six months, but you may never walk the same again. And that's the pain point that we have in this country is getting this right. And I'll lastly say, Dr. King dies in 1968. He's assassinated. In his final book, he makes a really big deal about how, how much our history is itself a form of oppression and propaganda and insists that we have to come to terms and reckon with our past. So that's kind of why we've been looking around the world to see you know, what we might learn. One final question. Oh, sure. No, not yet. Uh, but if you're if you're B, Khalil Gibran Muhammad, whose great grandfather was Elijah Muhammad, this is not the topic you pick. So just being just being honest. So there you have it. Yep. One more? No? Yeah. <laughs> that was an easy one. <laughs> Brian, of course, go ahead. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I guess I'll, I'll just say that um, thank you for a great topic. I'm, I'm really interested in this. Actually, we were just at the Whitney Museum a few months ago, um, but I'm I'm curious how uh, in in America. There's a whole problem with how we give narrative and what, what stories we tell, but there's also this overlying massive hegemonic movie world where, you know, I think three generations ago, two generations ago, people learned about slavery from Gone with the Wind. And maybe now it's 12 years of slave. I don't, I don't know. And so, well, exactly. <laughs> My experience when we were at the Whitney Museum was that um, people who were touring with us turned to our family and said, we're so glad you're here. As if that was unusual, um, and I and I also feel like, you know, how many people are going to see the Twelve Years a Slave, a, a movie? So I'm just curious how you how you see the in America a lot of the stories we tell are not through the history books. It's not in the classrooms. It's in this other colossal um, media landscape. Yeah. Well, big problem. Um, we screened Steve McQueen's 12 Years a Slave at Schomburg, by the way, uh, when it first came out. Um, and because I spent time with the director of the Whitney Museum, um, for some reason, we're forgetting her name at this moment, uh, we talked about the audience for the museum. We talked about visitorship and demographics. And whoever said that to you, 
just was imposing their own sense of things. Yeah, they get a ton of white visitors. They also, uh, Ashley, that's her first name. She told me that um, it, it, it wasn't uncommon, and this would have been three years ago. I do not know if it's true today, that um, some of those white visitors say to her, because she's white, um, we were told at the hotel to skip this one. Um, so, um, so the white people who do show up, <laughs> presumably some percentage of them are self-selecting, you know, into this difficult, uh, this difficult history. But uh, the question about popular culture, I mean, you know, the short version is, of course, that um, American popular entertainment, the minstrel stage, to the birth of Hollywood talkies, to the birth of a nation, have all run through narratives of white supremacy and the adoption of anti-black racism. Uh, and so, while Hollywood and popular culture have the potential to subvert that, and certainly there have been forms of this, uh, including hip hop culture to some degree, it both subverts and reinforces depending on what, you know, what we're looking at. Um, my goal is that before you show up at the movie theater or you pop in the, or pop in, that's showing my age, the DVD, Netflix just stopped shipping DVDs last week. Um, before you stream the next big version of some, you know, complicated film that reinforces white supremacy, you would have learned this um, from your preschool teachers and your parents at some point in the future would have learned it. And so they'd be screening for, you know, in other words, this is why the stories we tell about the nations we live in matter to the people we produce. And while I'm not naive enough to believe that you'll ever eradicate the thirst for greed and power, which runs through um, identifying a group of people who are to blame or scapegoat for this or for that. Um, I do believe that uh, we have such low-hanging fruit for getting our history right in the classroom first so that whatever shows up on the big screen, you know, people will be like, this is trash, um, or I don't want to be a part of this, or it'll just be, you know, some indie film for a bunch of right-wingers, you know, like the the many books that they already have. <laughs> so that's how I think about it. So. Okay. I'm coming to dinner. I think you've got a follow-up. All right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, 
one more please perfect thank you Thank you. 